I'm completing the entire mainline Pokemon franchise in chronological order with two challenges standing in front of me. The first, we're doing a hardcore Nuzlocke in all 39 mainline Pokemon titles released in North America, and the second, no repeat Pokemon may be used. If I choose Fennekin in X version, I can't use it in Y version or anywhere else. Same goes for every other Pokemon. So make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any parts of this series. We're making a last minute push to 200,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and I think we can just barely make it with your help. Thank you for watching, and let's jump straight in. Actually, before we begin, I just wanted to bring up a charity event my fellow content creator and pal Simo has been doing for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. He suffered with ulcerative colitis for about 15 years and details his story in this video, which I'll be leaving a link to in the description. This chronic inflammatory disease currently has no cure, but that's where you can potentially help. Next to the video will be an integrated donation link to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation to help fund their research to find a cure, and and to follow in line with Alex's donation incentives, I decided to make a few of my own. For every milestone achieved, I'll be making these dedicated videos for you all to enjoy in the coming months. All proceeds will go directly to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and I truly hope that we can make an impact so that Alex is one of the last people that has to suffer from this disease. One more thing before we get into it, I just want to give a huge thanks to this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Have you ever noticed that during the Christmas season, it's very easy to get lost in all the discount offers? Better yet, notice that those discount offers are all things you've recently searched for? Well, Surfshark VPN is here to ensure you don't get those targeted ads and so much more. Surfshark is a virtual private network that encrypts all of your personal data from passwords to pictures to private messages and more to keep your information from getting into the wrong hands. I personally connect to public Wi-Fi a lot, whether it be at a local restaurant or at the airport, so ensuring my info won't be taken by the grubby iron hands of scammers and identity thieves is at the top of my priority list and it should be on the top of yours too. Plus, you can get access to more than a dozen different Netflix libraries and much more by switching to one of their more than 1,700 Surfshark servers around the world. Secure your digital life today and sign up for Surfshark by scanning either the QR code on screen or by using the link in the description. Use the promo code MEATBALL at checkout to get a two-year plan at 85% off and with three extra months for free. And for some reason, if you don't like it, Surfshark has a 30-day money-back guarantee. The clock's ticking. What are you waiting for? Grab Surfshark VPN today for that added sense of security, especially during this holiday season. And with all that said, let's get back into Pokemon X. So, X and Y is where the franchise starts being helmed by Game Freak's secondary team while they prioritized the Gear Project. No, not that Gear Project. If Pokemon had Soul Bad Guy running around as the champion, I'm pretty sure we'd all be cheering for it and singing, That is bullshit crazy! And, you know, all that nonsense. Anyway, all of those funny coincidences aside, Gear Project was helmed by Team One, the primary team that worked on games like Harmonite and Little Town Hero, probably the two most successful games that came out of the project, as they were attempting to release games that would have just as much of an impact as Pokemon did when they originally released. And while I completely understand why they were doing so, as many of those who had been around since the beginning were burnt out after working on this franchise since the early 90s with Kapumon and what would eventually be Pokemon Red and Green in 1996. Point is, Pokemon X and Y were usually considered where the downward slope begins on the bell curve of Pokemon, and I cannot agree more. These games are just kind of here. They're fun, as all Pokemon games are, but the lack of content is telling. After all, look at the amount of areas and the level jump between gyms 1 and 2, going from 12 to 25, and going from Route 4 all the way to Route 10 before hitting Salage City. But then every subsequent gym would have barely any routes and areas between them. I hate to preface this video with this much foreshadowing and negativity, but I think it's smart to inform you about these circumstances as this affects our Nuzlocke adventure. Only around 70 new Pokemon means that we're going to have to work with a lot of previous generations worth of Pokemon, not to mention I'm not allowed to use Mega Evolutions, and on top of that for future generations, Z-Moves or Dynamax, so those are off the table. However, I don't think that's even a problem due to how easy these games are. Most trainers have Pokemon without full movesets. Heck, you can see from Serena's team before the Kumarine Gym battle against Ramos that her Frogadier literally only knows Quick Attack and Water Pulse. Yeah, 
it was rushed, plain and simple, and because of that we don't have much to deal with in terms of major battles. The eight gym leaders, the rival battles against Shauna, Serena, Tierno, and Trevor, the Lysander fights, the Elite Four, and the Champion are all we have to contend with. Heck, I'd even say the rival fights against Serena are the only ones worth talking about because the other three are kinda just there and only show up like once or twice, but hey, I'll take what I can get. Without further ado though, let's grab our starter. After being nicknamed after the most horrendous Earth insect on the planet, we're able to get Fennekin as our starter. A Pokemon that evolves into the monstrous Fire Psychic type, Fennekin is going to be a powerhouse as it starts out with Ember, eventually working its way through moves like Psybeam, Psyshock, Mystical Fire, Flamethrower, and Psychic as we work our way through the moveset optimization. Of course, with coverage like Solar Beam, Grass Knot, and Shadow Ball carrying us to victory, alongside Calm Mind, which we can get as a TM reward from Olympia, the 7th Gym Leader, so we'll have access to it during the Lysander fights, and of course the Elite Foreign Champion. Afterwards, we can take out Shauna, beating her chestpin with two embers, telling our mom we're on our way, and heading off to Route 2. Our second encounter is going to end up being a Bunnelby, a normal type that ends up gaining the ground type upon evolution, while also being a physical attacker. It's a bunny, it's big, so therefore it is Chungus, plain and simple. But before we move onward, I want to highlight something that the Gen 6 games have specifically, and that's Super Training. Super Training allows us to do EV training without having to deal with experience and balancing before the level cap and making sure that we stay under it. Rather, we can just max them out as soon as we receive a Pokemon, while also being able to use reset bags to reset the entirety of our EVs in the event that we want to swap a mixed attacker's moveset around in preparation for a certain fight and aim it more towards a different side of the attacking spectrum. I'm not sure if it'll come up much, if at all, but we may as well keep our options open, even if this is an easy game. Also, Super Training is eventually a way for me to earn infinite money, as once a Pokemon is fully trained, that unlocks Secret Super Training, where things like Evolutionary Stones, Wings, and PP Ups and Maxes can be obtained. The PowerPoint boosting items will at least be useful, though I don't think we'll need to do much in the way of money grinding. Anyway, Bunnelby's getting trained in attack and speed, while Fennekin's getting trained in, of course, special attack and speed. Having a balance this early on is super appreciated, though much more appreciated is the fire typing on Fennekin in preparation for our first gym battle against Viola. She leads off with Surskit, a water and bug type that has the type advantage over Fennekin, so I instead lead off with Bunnelby to go for quick attack in the attempt to wear her down. The first one ends up being a critical hit as Bubble Connects, doing minimal damage as a second, non-critical quick attack manages to KO as Vivalon enters second. In case you were wondering how a non-crit was able to KO from that range, it's because critical hits starting in Gen 6 now only do 1.5 times the damage rather than double, so we can effectively play around crits even easier, not that we were doing it in the first place because critical hits never affect me, but that's just something to bring up now that it's happening. Vivalon comes out second and has the move Infestation, which if used, damages the target for 2-5 turns, while also locking the target out of swapping out akin to Wrap. So to mitigate this, I swap out on the first turn to Fennekin as Vivalon goes for Harden, being hit by a follow-up Infestation, which allows me to hit Ember for half damage straight after. Tackle does a bit more damage on the follow-up, as this still remains a 50 power move until next generation where it's nerfed to 40, even though I thought it was only 50 in Gen 5, but anyway, that's just the Mandela effect, but it's still not enough to bring down Fennekin, allowing for a second Ember to KO and win the match. Bug badge in the books, let's go take care of that big old chunk of game between Gyms 1 and 2. First things first, after getting the EXP share from Alexa upon exiting Santa Loon City, I'm arriving on Route 4 to do one thing first and foremost capture a new encounter in Flabebe. The final evolution, Florges, is an insanely strong special wall with a base stat north of 150 special defense, while also having a great special attack that's over 100. However, due to that base special defense, I don't really see a reason to EV train it in there, as I can instead EV train in special attack and speed in order to outspeed threats instead of, you know, taking attacks, which then lets me survive future attacks, while also you know, being able to deal damage, which is the goal of a Nuzlocke, I think. One super training session later, and we're able to head out through the route and get into Lumio City. 
No gym for us just yet due to a citywide power outage, even though I can see the buildings on. What the hell, game freak? So we grab a Kanto starter to shove into the PC from Professor Sycamore, never to see the light of day again as it realizes it will never feel love or another being's emotion ever again. Anyway, we're able to move on to Route 5 following this, and Fennekin evolves while we're here into Breaksin. But not only that, we can get another new encounter in Skiddo, who will thankfully be able to appreciate human emotion. This Pokémon follows the trend of Kalos Pokémon being a normal type along its actual typing. Uh, see Skiddo being normal grass, Litleo being normal fire, Diggersby being normal ground, Heliolisk being normal electric. I don't know why, but they had a fetish for the normal type during this generation. Anyway, straight after, we've got a fight against Tierno. He has a single core fish with exactly Vice Grip and Sword Stance, which is kind of threatening, but thanks to Skiddo, I can just use Vine Whip twice after taking a Vice Grip to KO. Like I said, the rivals outside of Serena are just not worth talking about that much, but we'll give them the time of day for at least X version. No promises and Y. There's quite a bit in between here in Solage City, with Camphrier Town, getting the Poke Flute from the Parfum Palace, waking up the Snorlax and immediately running away, all leading to Connecting Cave, where I grabbed my next new encounter in Axew. I figure we're not going to get too many other good places for Gen 5 Pokémon, considering this series is going to end before Gen 5 remakes get made, so we'll go ahead and throw one in right here. I'll be Eevee training it, of course, in attack and speed. We're going to have access to Dragon Dance, as well as physical moves like Dragon Claw, Poison Jab for coverage against fairies, and Dig for the Steel types. Seems pretty cut and dry to me. Oh yeah, I guess I should mention, fairy types are now a thing and <laughs> they're going to be a little bit difficult because they're kind of broken in Gen 6, but that's why we have poison type moves. We're going to have a steel type coming up. Spoiler alert. But anyway, we go into Route 8 um, uneventfully, letting me get to Ambret Town, heading through Route 9 to take out Team Flare in the Glittery Cave, picking up the Sail Fossil in the process. I'm not sure if I'm going to use Amora in this run. I think it ends up depending on how my play ends up being and whether or not I make it to the league without losses. So I'll just keep the Fossil in the bag for safekeeping in case I do need it. On my way out of Ambrette Town, though, I make sure to grab the old rod, as we're going to be using it for our Route 8 encounter on Love Disk. Now, while I'm not using Love Disk, I'm actually going to be using it for a trade up in Solage City so that I can get a Steelix. Why is this guy trading me a 100% old rod encounter for a Steelix? I don't know. Stupidity aside, I wanted to reserve Onyx for Let's Go, but Steelix just wouldn't have a good place to be used otherwise. So here's a perfect place for a crazy tank that can also hit relatively hard with stuff like Gyro Ball, Earthquake, and Rock Slide. Speaking of which, I decide to Eevee train Steelix in Defense and Special Defense. While yes, the attack stat is getting neglected here despite being relatively high, I think I have plenty of other attackers that will do fine. Plus, with the sheer defensive capability, plus Protect and Leftovers being accessible relatively early, before the 4th gym combined, I don't think we'll have much trouble with Steelix being able to survive just about anything thrown at the brick shit house. With all that taken care of though, it's time for the gym. However, the level cap is 25, which is the exact level that our newly evolved Floette happens to learn Magical Leaf. This gives us a coverage move that is special, as well as a Stab Fairy move earlier in Fairy Wind to use our special attacker. So why not go grab a Shiny Stone and fully evolve it? Well, thankfully, we can get that stone from Secret Super Training, sending the newly evolved Diggers Bee on through and somehow getting the Shiny Stone on the first clear of the level, very lucky, evolving Floet into Florges just in time to not be used at all. See, Steelix, despite being a trade, actually still obeys us at this point in time, so I can just sit here and wall up against Grant's lead Amora, surviving an Aurora Beam as I hit Gyro Ball for nearly a one-shot. Unfortunately, this leads to a Hyper Potion, in which I follow up with a Smackdown, taking one more Aurora Beam that fortunately doesn't lower my attack, to bring Steelix to around 60% HP as the second Gyro Ball takes the KO. Out comes the Rock Dragon-type Tyrant following up, and due to being part Rock, Gyro Ball is the perfect move here, although a flinch and two crits from Bite does bring Steelix down to far too low of HP to survive another attack, so I have to swap out into Diggersby to ensure we nab the KO with a super effective Mud Shop to get the win. Two down, six to go, thankfully with some shorter gaps in between gyms now. After a quick scuffle with the Team Flare Grunts on Route 10 and into Geosenge Town, I just have to ask one question. You see the grunt that's going towards the stone pillar. The grunt disappears, yet when you pursue, there's no entrance. 
How are you not smart enough to throw at least one of your Pokemon out and start destroying the stone to figure out what is going on? Well, this is the Pokemon universe where Ash has no idea he's being duped by Team Rocket for the 1,562nd time. <sighs> anyway, we've got a quick battle against Karina still in Geosenge Town. She's got two Lucarios, both with the same moveset, and both knowing Metal Sound despite having exactly zero special moves to her team. It's great, and allows me to solo both with breaks in, nailing two embers on Lucario number one after taking a power-up punch and a Metal Sound, doing the same to Lucario number two after taking power-up punch and faint. I suppose if there was one reason to use Lucario in this game over Black 2, it would have been power-up punch, but there's plenty of other fighting types that can take advantage of it, so I'm not too worried. Except for Hawlucha. That guy's off-limits until USUM, because that is a broken in-game trade on Route 2. Can't believe they put it before the first trial. Anyway, Route 11 is a really, really short route leading into Reflection Cave, which is also really, really short and provides very little challenge for me. There is one scare in here because of a Hawlucha, because Brakeson takes a Rock Tomb for massive damage, but that's because Bulbapedia doesn't list moves on regular trainers, and there are no other good sites for knowledge like this, keyword being good, otherwise I'm sure I would have known. Enough dwelling in the cave though, on the other side is Shalor City, the home of our third gem battle against Karina, despite already beating her once and probably should have been able to earn the Rumble Badge off of it, but hey, I'm not complaining. Beforehand, though, we've got to take care of Serena in the Tower of Mastery. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, though, her Pokémon do not have full movesets aside from Meowstic, as Absol only has Bite Slash and Quick Attack, while Frogadier only has Quick Attack and Water Pulse. We're starting Florges against Meowstic first, though, using Protect to not take damage from Fake Out, then hitting a Magical Leaf for around a third before Light Screen is set up. From here, it's a bit of a war of attrition, as I've got Wish and Protect to ensure that I can outheal any of her attacks, doing so, and eventually KOing as Absol comes in while I'm at nearly fully HP. From here, we can get back up to full with Wish, followed up by a Bite, then a Protect on my end to prevent more damage. It's pretty cut and dry from here, though, as Fairy Wind nearly KOs, then a second outspeeds and does KO as Frogadier comes out third. This, of course, goes down to two Magical Leaves after landing a Quick Attack for the KO in the win. Very nice, though most of my Pokémon are getting very close to the level cap, if not are already there. So getting through Karina's Gym Trainers is a little difficult. So much so, because I end up overleveling Steelix. At least Steelix is the least useful Pokémon for this Gym, but it does tell a pretty significant problem. See, with the EXP in Gen 6, you cannot split them between Pokémon, as all Pokémon that enter the battle end up getting the full amount, mixed in with the EXP share giving everyone a bunch when it's on, you know, makes for a difficult time. So much so that with Steelix being at level 33, it'll have to sit out for this battle. I also realized that the leftovers are on Route 12, which I go to try to retrieve them, but sadly I can't get to them without Surf, so I've got to take out Karina first. She leads off with Mianfu as I go with Florges, using Protect to block Fake Out like I did against Serena, then using Fairy Wind to KO as Machoke enters second. I nearly one-shot with Fairy Wind as she lands Rock Tomb, lowering my speed in the process. Of course, that means that a Hyper Potion is coming next turn, so I match that with Wish in order to heal off that Rock Tomb, plus the second as I hit another Fairy Wind to nearly KO, though those speed drops are adding up way too much. I see a second Hyper Potion, but we end up getting a high roll on damage with Fairy Wind, KOing from full as Hawlucha enters last. We're at full HP, so this bodes well, especially when she ends up going for Body Press, damaging herself off of this nifty little held item I picked up called the Rocky Helmet, as Fairy Wind lands for massive damage. Then, because she ends up going for Body Press again, she KOs herself due to the Rocky Helmet winning me the fight. I'm kind of surprised that she didn't end up going for Power Up Punch or Hone Claws to boost her attack before going for Body Press, but hey, I'll take it, no need to complain. Now that I can use Steelix again, I'm going to really take the EXP thing much more carefully. I believe with my attitude as well of being untouchable in Gen 6, then I'm going to make a mistake eventually, and that was probably the lightest one I could make, so I'm just going to get that idea out of my mind. We're going to play around crits, we are going to do all of the things that I would normally do in a difficult Pokemon game here, and hopefully that will be enough for us to get through without any deaths. With that gym battle done though, we're thrown into the Mega Evolution tutorial, in which we will never do it again until... Wise tutorial. 
It just makes things too easy when literally only two trainers in the game that use it are Lysander on his last fight and the champion, so there's no reason for us to be able to use it. But with this tutorial done, I think it's time that we say farewell to our friend Diggersby. See, we can get a free Lapras here on Route 12, and I've already got a normal type on the team in Go Goat, so I think we're much better off replacing it and getting a Water and Ice type combo. I'll be EV training Lapras in HP and Special Attack, so that it can be a bulky tank that can also take the attacks of Dragon moves and fire back with a powerful Ice Beam since that's Lapras' main purpose. Last thing before we move on, I know that using a Gen 1 Pokemon is rather dangerous at this point, but Lapras is just not available early enough in Let's Go to Matter, plain and simple. By the time we hit the Sylph Company in those games, we'll have access to other Water-type Pokemon that we haven't used yet, like Psyduck, Shelter, Horsey, since remember we only used Kingdra and Black version, Staryu, Ammonite, Kabuto, well, not those last two, but still, there's plenty of other options there. Alright, now that we've grabbed the leftovers from Route 12, we can get into Kumarian City, ride the tram over to the other side, and get ready for our next gym battle. Well, we would if it wasn't for Serena getting in the way. She leads off with Meowstic once again as I go with Steelix. Protecting against the fake out, then going for Smackdown as Disarming Voice does exactly 4 damage. Leftovers will certainly make a difference now, making it so that it's as if we didn't take any damage whatsoever, though Psybeam does a bit more than I had anticipated as she hits it next turn. I move over to return as Smackdown barely does any damage, taking two Psybeams in the process, including a critical before taking her down to red HP. Another critical comes straight out as a third return ends up grabbing the KO, leveling up Steelix and learning Rock Slide over Smackdown as Frogadier comes out second. Now I gotta swap after using Protect, as Water Pulse is a bit too threatening, but by swapping into Lapras, all he can do is use Quick Attack as Water Pulse will just heal me thanks to Water Absorb as we see here. Body Slam gets the KO here after a few uses, leaving just Absol to attempt to flinch Lapras out of the game, failing to do so, and using Slash at the end of it all, going down to two Surfs. Alright, well, uh, the only piece of advice I have for you is to learn some more moves for the love of all that is super effective. God. One Kumarine Gym later and we're ready for Ramos. As much as I'd love to throw Lapras out there and just Ice Beam the entire team away, that water typing does make him a liability. However, Axew is not as much of one. Having the resistance to Grass, a super effective move in Poison Jab, Leftover's Recovery with Protect, and Dragon Dance boosting both his attack and speed, that should be enough to put this little guy over the top. Ramos leads Jump Bluff with Acrobatics as I go for Dragon Dance, taking a little under half as Leftovers recovers twice after Protect, giving me just enough to survive a critical as I use a second Dragon Dance, going down to red HP and healing out of it with Protect, finally going for Poison Jab on the fifth turn to KO in one shot. Second out is Go Goat, so I use Protect to get some more HP back, better safe than sorry, then go for Poison Jab next turn, outspeeding and KOing as Weepin' Bell comes out last. Now since Poison Jab is neutral here, it only makes sense to use Protect, then instead Dragon Claw, as the stab bonus will do more damage, ensuring my victory and the fourth gym badge of 8, as well as the TM for Grass Knot, which will be very nice for several of my special attackers at some point. Now that we can... Oh, wait, phone call? This world is imperfect. Uh, yes, I know it is. Please. I've been told that by about a half dozen other people by this point. Please go away. With the fourth badge in hand though, we can head on through the Kalos Desert on Route 13, skipping out on a Gibble encounter that I really would have loved to use, but it needs to be held for BDSP, then recovering the Kalos power plant from these flare f***ers. What can I say? I love alliteration, and I love my starter evolving. Welcome aboard, Delphox, and the Psychic type. Seriously, how is Brakeson not part Psychic type? I could have sworn this Pokemon gained the secondary typing by stage one, but I'll just chalk that up to the Mandela effect being an asshole again. However, I've got a comment. Why does this admin have a higher level Houndoom compared to Clemence level cap? Seems like they forgot to make it 36 instead of 38. But who cares, it's only one Pokemon, it dies immediately. Also, I think this is the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to healing items throughout Kalos. Getting fresh water for $100 a pop and 50 HP recovery seems pretty good when a Hyper Potion is $1,200 and recovers 200. Digressions aside though, I can finally get back into Lumio City and the Prism Tower where the 5th Gym resides. Having gained access to the TM for Dig beforehand also makes things so much easier here, especially with Steelix, seeing as I resist just about every other attack Clement can throw at me besides the Electric Immunity. 
He leads off with Emolga, and no Volt Switch shenanigans here, folks. He can only hit me with Aerial Ace, and it barely does any damage, allowing for leftovers to heal it completely as two rock slides puts him in the dirt. Second out is the normal electric Heliolisk, and while it does have Grass Knot, it doesn't even do half, plus Dig is a two-turn move, allowing for more leftovers recovery. This KOs, and last out is Magneton, setting up electric terrain as I go for Protect. I suppose this is a chance for me to explain terrain, seeing as this is a new mechanic for Gen 6. I still can't remember how it works myself, since I don't play these games nearly as much as I do Gens 1-5. through 5. But hopefully by explaining it, I can finally drill these stupid things into my thick skull. Grassy Terrain boosts grounded grass-type moves by 50%, while decreasing the power of Bulldoze, Earthquake, and Magnitude by 50%, while also restoring 1 16th HP of every Pokémon on the field between turns. Misty Terrain doesn't boost Fairy-type moves, but it does decrease the power of Dragon moves by 50%, while also preventing Pokémon from being afflicted by status conditions. Psychic Terrain boosts grounded Psychic-type moves by 50%, while also preventing Pokémon from being hit by moves with increased priority, namely stuff like Fake Out, making this the most useful one in official VGC formats due to the popularity of priority moves. Electric Terrain prevents Pokémon from falling asleep or becoming drowsy, while also boosting the power of Electric-type moves from grounded Pokémon by 50%, something that Magneton isn't, so yeah, it's not really doing anything. We just KO it with a Gyro Ball to break Sturdy, taking two Mirror Shots for around half, then hitting Dig to KO after two more turns with quad effective damage, winning the fight and the Voltage Badge. Alright, five in hand, three in the lead to go, and with my thoughts focused on not making a mistake, I can't see things going wrong throughout the rest of my run. But who knows, I could just get ass blasted later and it would be kind of funny, but let's try not to. With Clement done for, we're off to Route 14, immediately thrusted into a battle with Serena. She hasn't changed her team much, aside from an evolution for her starter. She leads Meowstic, so I lead Steelix, and just go for a myriad of attacks. It doesn't matter what it is. Gyro Ball, Rock Slide, Dig, and Protect, of course, to get Leftovers Recovery, taking out Meowstic in three attacks, with Absol coming out second. Due to Steelix's massive 200 base defense as well, we're having quite the easy time taking this Doom and Gloomer out to pasture, leaving just Greninja. Now, you'd think I'd swap out here, but now that Greninja's moveset only contains Quick Attack and Water Shuriken, a physical water move that hits 2-5 times with only 15 power each, there's no need to worry, KOing in a few turns to win the fight single-handedly. No need to sweep when you can just get punched in the face an egregious amount of times and it leave no evidence. With her done and dusted though, we can move on through Route 14, arriving in Lavare City, the home of our sixth gym battle. However, before we can fight Valerie, I figured we'd take our newly evolved Fracture on through Secret Super Training. Not to redo the EVs since those are perfectly fine, but to get as many PP ups and maxes as possible. I figured it would make sense to do this now, because early on it would have been a waste since we were changing movesets so often, but now that many of our Pokémon are really close to having their final movesets, I said screw it, grinding for a good number of them before our fight. With this preparation out of the way, Valerie's ready to battle, leading Mawile as I go with Steelix. I figured with the Steel typing, I'll have the advantage over the Fairy type gym, especially while also having the super effective Ground typing to combat this lead Mawile. Now, of course, this doesn't end up going perfectly since we have to deal with two Hyper Potions, but with her only having physical moves like Crunch, it makes it a breeze, though not exactly a short one, more like an egregiously long one as we eventually use all ten of our current Dig Power Points to take out Mawile as Mr. Mime enters second. Reflect is set up immediately as Gyro Ball does less than half, so we take a Psychic next turn as we hit a second, finally taking one more that lowers our special defense as the third Gyro Ball gets a critical, KOing and leaving just Sylveon. With the special defense drop and Reflect still up, I figured we can take the time to shake that special defense swap of course by swapping into Florges to resist Dazzling Gleam, then swap back in. Though Charm is definitely not making things easy, especially when topped off with the ability Cute Charm, which makes Gyro Ball a pretty ineffective move due to making contact with the opponent. I do swap back and forth in again with Florges to hit another Gyro Ball, but of course we get Cute Charmed again on the first landing of the attack, attempting to force a few more through but only getting her to around a quarter HP as I swap back and forth between Lapras and Steelix this time, finally using two more Gyro Balls after a Charm connects to KO, finally winning me the fight after that ridiculous War of Attrition.
And with Dazzling Gleam in our hands, Florgus finally has a good stab attack instead of the ridiculously mediocre 40 power Fairy Wind. No longer are we activating trap cards. The speed of the game has come too far for those. Patch 6-7 progression isn't too crazy, with the exception of the Pokeball Factory. Everything to do with Team Flare makes me not want to play the game though, since it's just terribly written filler since we needed to meet our evil tweem quota. After kicking the fannies of these room temperature IQ nutjobs though, we're able to run through routes 15 and 16, which by the way, have the best music in this entire game. If Gen 6 has one good thing, it's 100% the music. This theme, the gym battle theme with how unique the feeling is in comparison to other gym battle themes, the Pokeball Factory, Lysander's battle theme, Kalos Power Plant, Snowbell City, the champion battle, there's quite a few good tracks to be sure. But with those routes as well as the Lost Hotel out of the way, we're able to get into Dendemil Town, going north through the Frost Cavern to clear out even more of Team Flare at the end. Boy, it sure would be nice to progress without an utterly disappointing brick wall in the way, please and thank you. With the trainers defeated there as well, we're all clear to ride Mamoswine through Route 17, making it to Anastar City for our seventh and penultimate battle, but not before Serena challenges to yet another fight. She's added exactly one Pokemon to her team, so we start with Go Goat against her eternal lead, Meowstic, going for Bulk Up and Synthesis back to back just so we can survive this hail and a myriad of attacks from the opposition, getting hit with Psychic and. Shadow Ball. Hold up, Go Goat's part normal, right? Oh, alright, come on! I can't be a Mantella affected this many times in a single video! This is bullshit! I distinctly remember this too, how the heck did I not have this come up in literally 9 years since this game's release? Oh whatever, I'm able to just use Synthesis once more, KOing with Seed Bomb as Flareon comes out next. Yeah, with Synthesis only healing for a quarter with the Hail up, I gotta swap into Delphox to resist the upcoming fire type move and- Oh screw you AI for reading my inputs, now I gotta swap into Lapras to take a quick attack, KOing with a single surf next turn as Greninja comes out and tries using Dark Pulse, flinching but getting the utterly wise idea to use Water Shuriken on the follow up on a Pokemon with Water Absorb, healing Lapras up and allowing me to survive long enough to deliver two Thunderbolts, but not before Dark Pulse flinches again resulting in a third landing before I'm able to KO with Thunderbolt. This leaves Lapras at too low of HP as her last Pokemon Absol enters the field, so I swap into Steelix. Steelix, in all honesty, is my best course of action since everything else is damaged, including Florges who gets brought out before Steelix but is immediately pounced on for half damage, so I just stay out there and start wailing with Gyro Ball and other moves. Thankfully, despite Absol's access to Sword Stance, Steelix and that massive defense stat are enough to stand up against it, eventually allowing Steelix to outlast and KO Absol for the victory. Now that would have gone a lot better if it wasn't for the AI deciding it wanted to be a dick with Flareon, and I can't be mad. I didn't lose any Pokemon, so we're just gonna continue trucking along. One batch of gym trainers later, and we're ready for Olympia. She leads off with Sigilyph as I go with the newly evolved Haxorus, using Dragon Dance twice as she goes for Reflect, then gets a critical with Psychic. At least Protect can get me another turn of HP recovery from Leftovers, then a third Dragon Dance can be used since I can survive another normal Psychic. One more Protect eliminates Reflect, allowing for Dragon Claw to KO next turn, using another round of Protect as Slowking enters the field, thankfully without Reflect, as we KO at plus 3 with another Dragon Claw. Last out is Meowstic, so we just do the rotation of Protect and Dragon Claw again, once more outspeeding thanks to Dragon Dance and KOing to win the fight. Sweet! And now it's time to be dragged to hell. Seriously, if you thought Team Flare was annoying before, you sure as heck haven't played through this game enough times to realize that the ultimate weapon and AZ stuff is just so tedious and boring, not helped by the fact that I don't have a Pokemon with Fly to use and get into Lumio City in the Lysander Cafe, so I have to go back there manually. After wiping out the two people standing guard, we can head inside and take on Lysander for the first of three times during this. Yeah, three boss battles against the same guy within like an hour of each other, with just slightly different teams each time. He leads off with Mianfu on the first one, so I taught Calm Mind to both Florges and Delphox beforehand, the TM that we got from Olympia after beating her, using it as Mianfu going for Sword Stance on turn one. The singular boost is enough for me to KO Mianfu in one shot, not that it was needed since Dazzling Gleam is already super effective, but rather for Gyarados to ensure that this is a two-shot KO. 
Sadly, we're nailed by a super effective Iron Head that drops us all the way down to 13 HP, but with a rotation of Dazzling Gleam, this puts him down, doing the same as Murkrow crumbs in third, going down to the super effective Dazzling Gleam as Pyroar enters last. Now, I know I'm not equipped to go against Pyroar at this low of HP, so instead, I swap into Lapras after using Protect, taking a little over half from a Critical Fire Blast, then staying in and taking a regular one to get to low yellow HP as Surf gets the one-shot KO, winning me the match. Well then, that wasn't too too bad, so after a few grunts and a trip to Geosench Town later, how does the second of three falls go? Well, I think this clip basically explains it. Would you be interested in f***ing my ass? Well, perhaps we should go to my office. Excellent! I mean, it's not that straightforward, though Haxorus takes out Mian Xiao with a Dragon Dance and Dragon Claw combo after seeing a Sword Stance, leading to Gyarados out second as Intimidate triggers to get rid of our attack buff. From here, I just swap into Florgas to take the Outrage, being immune to Dragon-type moves, then using Dazzling Gleam for exactly half as Iron Head does around 75%. Since we didn't have the time to set up a Calm Mind, I can't risk going for another and getting a low roll, as we all know those are the bane of my existence and we're not taking that chance. I swap into Go Go, taking Iron Head, then using Horn Leech to heal back some of that as Outrage lands for some massive damage, but a second Horn Leech takes him down as I get back up to nearly half HP. Third out is Pyroar, so I swap into Lapras, take two Fire Blasts, KOing with Surf, leaving just the newly evolved Haunch Crow to go down to Ice Beam to win the fight. Easy as pie. 2-0 sweep means he can't get the salty run back fight, right? Well, unfortunately, that's wrong. After we capture Xerneas and shove it into the PC where it belongs, rotting in a sea of data, we're ready for round three as Dr. Octopussy is mad. Yeah, that's it, he's just angry. It's the same team again, so I go with Florges against Mian Xiao, using Calm Mind and Dazzling Gleam as he goes for Sword Stance, KOing before it becomes a problem. Have you seen this combo before? Second is Haunch Crow, so at least he's going in a different order, and plus he's saving the Mega Evolution for the end. So I use another Calm Mind as I take a Steel Wing for a little over half, using Protect to get some more HP back, then using a Dazzling Gleam to KO as Pyroar comes out third. I take the risk of a critical hit Fire Blast by going for a third Calm Mind, but it doesn't happen as the special defense boosts hold up, then using Protect to get some more HP back. Perfect. Despite Fire Resisting Fairy, I KO with a Dazzling Gleam next turn to leave just Gyarados. Now, this is made easier because of the Mega Evolution changing his typing from Water Flying to Water Dark, making Dazzling Gleam super effective and allowing me to walk away with the W in a solo endeavor that was even easier than the first two fights. Glad that this is finally over, but I've got to do it one more time in Y version. The more I continue this series, the more I realize that I actually don't enjoy like half the games in this franchise. Whatever happened to my childhood that where I thought that these were good, but are actually structurally terrible in comparison to RPGs that have compelling stories, like Chrono Trigger, Persona 4 and 5, Xenoblade Chronicles, and even non-turn-based ones. What about action RPGs like Astral Chain, Nier Automata, Tales of Berseria, all of these things that I played during my teenage years? I could go on, but I'm sure people are already mad at me for disparaging half of this franchise as mid, and for some people, this is all they play. Maybe I gotta do some more challenges for other games once this series is over, but I digress. After clearing out Route 18 in the Terminus Cave for the TMs and EXP, we're ready to head into Coraway Town. This isn't really an important stop, it's just a filler city with another battle against Professor Sycamore, this time with the fully evolved Kanto starters. It's nothing that Haxorus can't handle with some dragon dances, setting up three of them before we take enough damage for Protect to matter, using a fourth, then Protect, then a fifth, then Protect, kinda just the standard at this point. Helps that we resist the grass type, but finally getting the sixth and final dragon dance off before using Dragon Claw on Venusaur, Blastoise, and Charizard to win. Unga Bunga reigns supreme, ladies and gentlemen. Doing fights like this with the sweeping over and over again can get to be rather boring, but just watching a giant dragon tear through the Kanto starters gets a kick out of me. Moving on to Route 19, we've got a series of three rival battles back to back to back, as Shauna, Tierno, and Trevor are interested in taking me on, with unfortunately no healing in between the first two. This can sometimes get dicey in Nuzlocks, but I've got a great lead for both of them. Shauna leads Delcaddy as I go with Florges, using Calm Mind three times as she goes for Charm twice, then Play Rough for minimal damage. 
From here I just start alternating with Protect to ensure that we're at the highest of HP for the fight, getting to max special attack and defense, then using Wish to ensure that we're at full HP for Tierno, blasting Delcaddy, Gudra, and Chestnut with Dazzling Gleam once each for all three KOs. Second up, Tierno leads with Talonflame, which is quite the powerful contender, so I swap the Lapras to KO with Surf, then into Go Goat as he brings in Roserade. See, we've got the ability Sap Sipper, which boosts our attack every time we're hit by a grass type move, and Roserade has literally one move on the move set in Petal Dance. How in the holy name of Arceus does this thing not know, like, Sledge Bomb or something? Oh my god! Uh, well, we set up two bulk ups as he hits us with three pedal dances, allowing for me to land Return to KO Roserade, then Horn Leech on his follow up Crawdont to win the fight. Okay. Third up now, we've got Trevor leading Raichu, a much more competent trainer, hopefully. So, of course, on turn one, we swap into Steelix for that electric type immunity using Dig on turn two, then landing it on turn three to KO, and trigger static. I've had it with this stupid ability, it just needs a nerf. Why is it able to trigger so often? Second out is Florges going down to a single gyro ball after landing an energy ball for around a third of my HP, so I guess this is helping more than it's hindering due to lowering my speed even more than it normally would be at. Helps that Gyro Ball is also super effective on two of his three Pokemon, allowing for Steelix to take the KO on the follow-up Aerodactyl to win the fight. Perfect, that's our last roadblock before hitting Snowbell City, but of course once we do, we can't fight Wolfric yet since he's over in the Pokemon Village. So it's a pretty easy trek through Route 20 to get to him. This route's important for one thing and one thing only though, the TM for Energy Ball, giving us a great coverage move for Florges specifically to pair with Calm Mind and Dazzling Gleam, soon to be replaced with Moonblast. But with one set of gym trainers out of the way, let's get to our last gym badge for X. Wolverick leads with an Aboma Snow when I go with Delphox, of course, fire type kind of melts ice, setting up a Calm Mind as he goes for Ice Beam, doing the same next turn as he actually freezes with Ice Beam. All good, I can just defrost immediately by using Flamethrower and... No, come on, man. I'm not getting Mandela affected again. This is the third time, and I distinctly remember that using a fire type move would thaw your Pokemon out immediately. But according to Bulbapedia, it only happens if a fire type move lands against you. Well, at least I can sit here for a few turns and see if I thaw out, and thankfully I do, using Flamethrower to KO Aboma Snow, Avalug, and Cryogonal all with one shots to win the fight. Now that was almost a disaster. I'm not sure what my backup plan was if Delphox didn't thaw out in time, nor do I want to think about it since we're past this and there's no need to worry about it any longer, right? Well then, one victory road passage later and we're ready for the league, right? Well, we've got to get through Route 21 to get to Victory Road, which houses a few trainers and TMs that I want, but also around halfway through Victory Road, we've got our last encounter with Serena. She's added another member to the team, but as always, we've got that lead Meow Stick, so we're going Florgas again to get those Calm Minds up in the attempt of an easy sweep. And I've got to say, this time around, it's much easier. We now have Moonblast as opposed to Dazzling Gleam for the slight power boost, and Energy Ball for coverage does wonders for anything that resists Fairy, except Fire types, because they are just jerks. Anyway, after setting up all six Calm Minds, I'm able to KO Meowstic with Moonblast, Greninja with Energy Ball, Flareon with Moonblast despite the resistance and Quick Attack having priority, Protect and Moonblast for Altaria to get some of that lost HP back, doing the same with Absol since I fear no Sword Stance, I know I'll outspeed and I know I'll KO, just like I know how I'll get pulled out of this room by an unknown assailant in about three seconds. No! No! With her disposed of, we can finally head into that League Hall, and I've got to give Kalos props for truly encapsulating the presentation that the League should have. Regal, respect, but ultimately fear in the eyes of the common trainer. But I am no common trainer. I shall rip the band-aid off and erase the facade of it all. This is the Pokemon League, and I've got just the plan to tear them to shreds. Melva's my first target, and of course we're going for Haxorus Sweep. This time we've got Earthquake as our coverage move of choice over Poison Jab, since we're not dealing with any fairy types. So I use two Dragon Dances, taking a few Hyper Voices from Pyroar in the process, before going for an Earthquake to KO in one clean shot. Second out is Talonflame, and plus two is plenty enough for me to KO with a neutral Dragon Claw, leading to Torkoal. 
Despite the fact that I used Protect as she used Curse, Earthquake is still a strong enough move at plus one to KO in one shot, leaving just Chandelure to fall to an Earthquake just as well to win me the fight. Pretty easy if I do say so myself. And by shifting my lead to Florges, we can do the same thing with Seabold. He's got a lead Clawitzer that knows only special moves, so of course we're going for Calm Mind here to bolster our special defenses, taking those attacks while also boosting special attack for Energy Ball. The first few I can alternate Calm Mind and Protect, but by the end, he's just doing such pitiful damage that after hitting Energy Ball at plus 6, we're already at full HP thanks to Leftovers. Second is Gyarados, Moonblast, gone. Third is Barbarical, Energy Ball, uber dead due to quad weakness, leaving just Starmie to fall to another Energy Ball. Two down, two to go. Third on the radar is Wickstrom, leading Klefki with, you guessed it, either special moves or non-impactful status moves like Spikes. This allows for me to set up five Calm Minds with my lead Delphox, then blast out Flamethrower to sweep the team, starting with Klefki, but getting interrupted rather quickly with Probobass. See, we've been put under Torment by Klefki, not a problem when you have Protect, but when he hits you with a critical power gem, bypassing your boosts with Calm Mind after Sturdy activates and nearly one-shots you from full, that kinda wrecks you a bit. Thankfully, we're able to take advantage of the situation by using Flamethrower and Psychic back and forth to ensure that the full restores don't give him a turn to use another power gem, getting back up to around a third HP as we KO and Scizor comes in third. Protect blocks Night Slash as Flamethrower KOs, then Protect blocks his Aegislash's Shadow Claw, putting him in blade form to be utterly obliterated by a Flamethrower to win me the fight. Three for three in terms of sweeps, though this last one wasn't exactly as smooth as I would have hoped, since Sturdy is a bitch of an ability post-Gen 5. Last up is Drasna, leading Dragalge as I go with Delphox again, mostly to get Psychic on turn 1 to KO since that poison typing would otherwise rip through Florges like an early morning breakfast pancake. Second out is Altaria, so we can start going for Calm Mind, though only once since Sing immediately puts us to sleep. Ah, I love 50% I love accurate moves, those are great. Thankfully, she goes for Cotton Guard next turn to boost her physical defense, giving us a turn's reprieve to try to get out of sleep without taking damage, eventually waking up around half HP, then getting two more Calm Minds off with a Protect in between before Sing hits again. 50% accuracy, ladies and gentlemen, I don't understand it. Her primary method of attacking, though, is with Dragon Pulse, and a critical doesn't even do all that much, so I'm fine just sitting here and waiting to wake up again, finally doing so at a higher HP than I was put to sleep at. Two more Calm Minds puts me up to 5, and she's basically given up on Sing, allowing for me to just go off from here. KOing Altaria with Psychic, Noivern with the same after being outsped and nailed with a Light Dragon Pulse, and Dredigan for the hat trick to win the last of our four fights. All that remains is Diantha, and with her lead being a Hawlucha, I had a little bit of a struggle figuring out what the lead should be, but I figured out that I can't really go for a sweep here. I have to actually think, which is probably a miracle for an interesting champion fight. I decided to go with Florges since she's the Pokemon that can survive any attack here, and KO with Moonblast with no boosts, though getting poisoned off a poison jab does make for a little bit of a conundrum. I can't stay out for a long, long time, but I do manage to get a 2 for 1 in terms of KOs by getting Tyrantrum down with another Moonblast, leading to Aurorus. I probably should have fired off Energy Ball here before Light Screen was used, but I wasn't too sure if I could survive another attack, or if she would go for another attack with Aurorus, so instead I went for Protect to see what he would go for, and yeah, Light Screen is probably the worst of them. From here, I can swap into Steelix, but with Blizzard getting the freeze before I can use Gyro Ball for quad effective damage, I'm forced to swap into Lapras and start using Surf, seeing Light Screen set up for a second time as Surf starts doing less than half. He's also got Thunder, which does around a third to Lapras as I start alternating with Protect, so those Light Screen turns elapse at the perfect time following the second full restore, KOing with another Surf and putting me up 6 to 3. I take a risk with her fourth Pokemon and staying at two thirds, dodging a Focus Blast from Gudra and going for Ice Beam for over half. But in all honesty, I just completely missed the fact that she had Focus Blast on her moveset. <laughs> Go figure, Focus Blast misses so much that I missed it on the moveset. So after the first brush with Disaster, I swap into Delphox in case it hits in order to resist the attack, which it does land, so that was a good idea, only taking around 15% damage as Psychic picks up the KO following up. 
Fifth out is Gorgeist, the perfect Pokemon for Delphox to tear through with Flamethrower due to being part grass type, leaving just Gardevoir. I'm gonna protect here to let her Mega Evolve and see the move of choice, which, as expected, happens to be Shadow Ball. Makes sense, it's super effective, so I swap into Go Go to uh, take it, right? All good, as with the big root as my held item, Horn Leech heals an extra 30%, which brings Go Goat nearly back to full, all while Gardevoir dips below half, allowing for a Psychic to do just over half damage, and let me follow up with a second Horn Leech next turn to KO and win the bout, as well as the title of champion. And would you look at that, Deathless 2. It could have been one, since uh, <laughs> Focus Blast could have landed on Lapras. But then again, I'm probably blowing that one out of proportion. After all, Lapras' special defense and HP are both through the roof, not to mention that's a non-stab move, so I was probably worried for nothing. But it is better to be safe than sorry, which is exactly the attitude we need to pull through Y version, especially since it's been an awfully long time since we've made it through a pair of games completely Deathless. So as always, with the second game in a pair, we're just gonna be going through our encounters, evolutions, and major battles. Not necessarily all of the filler stuff like we would for the first game. So with that said, we can grab our starter, this time being Froki. I'll be EV training him in special attack and speed primarily, despite there being a good few physical water and eventually dark type moves. I feel as though specializing in the special side of things and taking advantage of stuff like Surf and Dark Pulse is going to be more of a help to my team than if it were me forcing through physical moves like Water Shuriken or Night Slash, especially when we get coverage like Extra Sensory, Round, and Ice Beam, and of course a few other moves that are probably not going to be used, but we'll see. With that, we can use two bubbles on Shauna's Fennekin, KOing and leaving us to head out onto Route 2 to capture our first non-gift encounter in Fletchling. If you thought I was going to be leaving this guy out of our Gen 6 adventure, you've got another thing coming since this still living fried chicken is likely one of the most broken Pokemon introduced during Gen 6, and it didn't just make sense for us to use it in the last run due to overlapping typings with Fennekin. Attack and speed EVs, it's too obvious after all. Sword stance, fly, acrobatics, flame charge, flare blitz, steel wing, can't go wrong with any of that. That's all the encounters we need before fighting Viola, as we can use Fletchling's peck to attack Surskit thrice, KOing after a quick attack and a potion, leaving just Vivalon. This would have been a two-shot KO here if it weren't for Harden, but since Viola has the object permanence of a Farfa viewer, she doesn't realize she went for Harden last turn and goes for it again. Then we can get a third peck off scot-free, KOing and winning the fight in short order. One badge down, seven to go. Route 4 doesn't house any new encounters, nor does Lumio City, but Route 5 is where we'll be stopping next to grab Pancham. I wanted to use a fighting type, plus with Froki eventually evolving into Greninja, a dark type, we'll be able to evolve Pancham without having to grab another encounter. Two dark types isn't necessarily the worst thing either, especially when one is a special attacker and the other is physical, as we'll be throwing attack into Pancham, but also HP and defense split in half. I figured having him be more bulky while dealing out massive amounts of damage eventually, with things like Return, Brick Break, Hammer Arm, Shadow Claw, Crunch, and the like, while also having access to Sword Stance would really make sure our team packed a punch. On our way through as well though, both Froakie and Fletchling evolved into Frogadier and Fletchinder, but that's not all of the new additions to the team before the second gym battle against Grant. The fourth member of the team is going to be Esper. We saw Serena use this one so much that I figured, hey, why not? A Serene Psychic Witch of her own is probably gonna do more help than harm, especially with access to the usual staples like Psychic, Shadow Ball, Thunderbolt, Energy Ball, the works. Fifthly, once we're finished up with the Poke Flute and Parfum Palace, we can head on through Connecting Cave, Route 8, Ambret Town, and Route 9 to get into Glittering Cave, encountering ourselves a Pharaoh Seed from the ceiling. In case you were wondering why we didn't use this in Gen 5, here's why. It's an early encounter that gets access to amazing physical moves like Power Whip and Gyro Ball for Stab, while also getting Curse to boost the physical attack and defense, while further decreasing our speed for Gyro Ball, and somehow, some way, we have an IV of 1 in speed, making Gyro Ball a force to be reckoned with. Match that with Protect and Leftover strats after EV training it in defense and special defense, and I think we've got one overpowered monster on our hands. 
Lastly, after clearing out Team Flare from the Glittering Cave, we can revive the Jaw Fossil we received in Ambret Town to get Tyrant, a Rock Dragon type that may not be speedy, but if it survives even just one attack, you better know you're gonna be getting torn to shreds with either a Stab Dragon Claw or Rock Slide, or maybe some coverage moves like Return or Earthquake for your troubles. And with that, we just train up to level 25, evolving Esper into Meowstic at that level, and we're ready for Grant. He leads off with Amora, so we go with Pancham, taking a takedown for less than half, as Karate Chop gets the KO immediately due to being quadruple super effective. Second is Tyron, in which we try going for Karate Chop again, but Stomp manages to get a flinch, so I stay in one more time to attempt to hit it for half, and I do, which is nice, but I am at way too low of HP. Finally taking the time to swap into Frogadier and cinch in that win with a neutral Water Pulse to finish the fight, giving us the Cliff Badge. With a full team on our hands, we don't have to worry about new encounters unless something accidentally goes down, but we'll also not have to worry about evolutions because all of them happen between the levels of 35 and 40, with the exception of Meowstic who just evolved, so we'll talk about those when they occur. As for battles, Serena's sitting in the Tower of Mastery over in Shallower City, just itching to get her Pokemon punched in the face, and I know just the Pokemon to do it. Pharaoh Seed is already coming in clutch with Curse. No leftovers necessary, as we're able to set up four of them before getting confused by Meowstic Psybeam, hitting ourselves twice in a row and eating away at our held Citrus Berry before we can start laying in with Pin Missile. See, this attack, while being really bad normally, is super effective on all of Serena's team at this point and for a good chunk of time, as the Psychic type Meowstic, Dark type Absol, and Grass type Quilladin all take super effective damage from this attack, making it the most effective strategy to solo her while also doing residual damage with the Iron Barb's ability, particularly on Absol and Quilladin. The latter of those ends up taking two pin missiles, since the first only landed twice, but the second does seal the deal and the victory. Straight after is our fight against Karina for the Rumble Badge, starting Mianfu as I go Fletchinder, and obviously after taking a fake out we're going straight for Swords Dance. We are slightly threatened by a non-very effective power-up punch from our opponent, but Flame Body <laughs> kicks in on this non-guts fighting type, giving a net loss of attack power and giving me good faith in using a second sword stance. Wake Up Slap does nothing on the follow-up, nor does another power-up punch as I use a third and final sword stance before healing with Roost, then sweeping the entirety of the team with Peck, KOing Mianfu, Machoke, and Halucha, all with one-shots to win the fight. Who knew that Peck, a 35 power move, could be so deadly once backed with absurdity? From here it's the rival and gym show for a couple of gyms, with Serena doing the same thing and challenging us before the fourth gym in Kumarine City. And just like before, we're just doing the same thing again with Pharaoh Seed. But unfortunately for her, we now have access to the leftovers item, as well as the TM for Protect, so it really is all over for her. Alternating six curses and protects means we're ready to commit an absolute atrocity of a war crime against her team, using Pin Missile to KO Meowstic, Absol, and Quilladin in quick fashion, though of course Quilladin is still the only one that survives more than one use of it, hanging on by a thread after the first mist, with the third being the charm and netting us the KO. Straight after, it's Ramos time, and hey, a gym leader soloed by Fletchinder, now where have I seen this before? Now I've gotten the HM for Fly to replace Peck, so at least it's not as funny, which I guess is probably a net negative for me, but at least we only need one sword stance because of that, since we take a critical acrobatics from Jump Luff before starting the rotation of Protect and Fly, giving us three turns of recovery for two attacks. Not that we needed it as we outspeed and KO Jump Luff, Go Go, and Weep and Bell in sequence to win the fight, evolving Flitchinder into Talonflame in the process. Alright, the team is finally coming together, especially once Frogadier evolves into Greninja, as now we have the Dark type on the team necessary to evolve Pancham into Pangoro. That's all for evolutions before we make the circle in on Lumio City, though, arriving at the Prism Tower for our fifth gym battle against Clemon. Now, since we don't have a ground type, we don't have a perfect out to his team, nor do we have, like, a really good good choice, it's just kinda Tyrant, and Tyrant doesn't even have Earthquake yet, so we're gonna have to make do. Here I decide to lead 
Pangoro against Emolga, just wanting to get him to use Aerial Ace rather than Volt Switch so I can neutralize the threat early. But after taking two of them following a sword stance and some leftovers recovery, Pangoro is unfortunately affected by both a critical and paralysis from static. From here, I swap into Meowstic as Magneton's on the field and uses Thunderbolt, doing over half but is thankfully not able to KO with the second once I use Light Screen, meaning that Meowstic lives to fight another day. From here, we can effectively bring in Tyrant to take a Thunderbolt for minimal damage due to both Light Screen and our Dragon Typing providing resistance, allowing for Bulldoze to be our quadruple super effective attack of choice. This is also perfect timing, seeing as we're able to heal lock this magnetic abomination into oblivion, not taking a single super effective mirror shot in the process, due to electric terrain ending on the perfect turn. Once the hyper potions are disposed of though, we're able to KO through sturdy and outspeed to finish it off thanks to Bulldoze's effect, leaving just Heliolisk. Now while Bulldoze does good damage, because of course it's against an electric type, Thunderbolt is still one hell of a move, bringing Tyrant down to only 10 HP. Well, shoot, I guess I gotta protect then swap. So I choose Pharaoh Seed for the sheer bulk and lack of offensive pressure from Heliolisk, especially at this low of HP. Sure, Thunderbolt still does almost a third, but that's a critical hit if you didn't notice. Letting me safely sit here and click the A button over return twice more to KO and win the fight. Alright, over halfway and nothing too serious in terms of misplays, so let's keep trucking along. Before we hit Route 14 though for our next rival fight, now that our level cap is 42, I'm going to be evolving both Pharaoh Seed into Pharaoh Thorn and Tyrant into Tyrantrum, then turning the EXP share off just to ensure I have the maximum advantage over her in terms of stats, especially since we're going for the three-peat in Pharaoh Seed line solo slaughters. She's starting... Well, you guessed it, Meowstic! So I'm starting Pharaoh Thorn, and it's a curse and protect stall time. I'm just hoping for no special defense drops with Psychic, and fortunately throughout my six turns of vulnerability, this doesn't happen, though criticals do occur. Not that they matter when she's mixing in Disarming Voice, a non-stab 40 power fairy move that's resisted because of the steel type, allowing me to hit all the turns necessary to max out our stats, then KO Meowstic and Absol with Power Whip, leaving just the newly evolved Chestnut to fall to Gyro Ball. Now if you think this is going to get any better with our next fight against her, don't worry. The next Pokemon she's going to add to her team is a Vaporeon. Hmm, I wonder what that Pokemon happens to be weak to. Anyway, Laver City and Valerie time, and Ferrothorn time again since, oh boy, does Steel happen to be the shining star against the fairy type. I trade curses with iron defenses from her lead Mawile for the first two turns before she starts going for Crunch, which does lower my defense a few times, but not enough for it to matter, and enough so that a stack of three iron defenses doesn't make up too much of a difference when it comes to all of that iron barbs damage, as three power whips through a hyper potion is enough to put her down, leading to Mr. Mime. This of course is going to outspeed, but she chooses to use Light Screen after I've set up six curses that boost physical attack. You know what? No, get absolutely owned. Just get completely ass blasted. You do not deserve your gym leader status whatsoever after that absolutely massive fumbling of the bag that we have just witnessed here. Goodbye Mr. Mime, goodbye Sylveon, hello Fairy Badge, and farewell to the 3D remake of Sabrina's Kanto Gym. At least we won't be saying you around until we hit Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. God, I gotta play Kanto again. One Pokeball Factory and few routes in a town later, and we're finally in Anastar City for our next rival battle before a gym. And stop me if you've heard this combo before. Ferrothorn vs Meowstic, Curse vs an onslaught of Shadow Ball Psychic and Disarming Voice, eventually ending in a sweep featuring Gyro Ball and Power Whip. The former takes out Meowstic, Chestnut after a Brick Break lands, and Absol after a Night Slash Critical only does around a third of Ferrothorn's HP, leaving just Vaporeon to come out and fall to the ladder. Or, in this case, off the ladder due to how much damage overkill that must have been afflicted there. 120 power, plus stab, plus super effective, plus 6 stages of attack, plus weakness, plus a maxed out attack EV, plus L, plus ratio, plus your white. Insert Vaporeon copypasta here, blah blah blah, here's our 7th gym battle against Olympia. 
In case it hasn't become obvious by now, this game has been absolutely overtaken by Ferrothorn to the point that I feel like we could nearly pull off a solo hardcore Nuzlocke if it weren't for Clemont, as we're able to curse and protect and curse and protect and curse and protect all the way till the cows come home, even through special moves from Sigilyph here, like Air Slash and Psychic, we can just sit here and do this old high defensive stat thing, finally landing a Gyro Ball while under Reflect and still KOing from full leading to Meowstic. It lands a Shadow Ball that lowers my special defense, but no matter as Gyro Ball gets the KO, leaving just Slow King. Now here I do kind of have to hit the 85% accurate Power Whip within two turns since she's going to go for Yawn on the first turn and then start setting up Calm Mind, which I do miss the first one so I'm panicking a little bit. See a Calm Mind before Therothorn actually does manage to land the second one, KOing and giving me the win. A little too close for comfort, I'm not sure what I would have done to Slow King had, you know, Therothorn not landed the Power Whip, but hey, we're getting there. Just one more three-peat through Lysander, and we'll be ready for our last gym battle. Back in Illumio City, we go for the first of our Lysander triple header battles, and you know what? I'm actually just gonna keep things brief here. All three battles are very similar, so I'm going to spare you the long details and tell you that all three were taken care of by exactly Talonflame with Sword Stance, Protect, Fly, and Flame Charge. Boy howdy, does this game really <laughs> give you way too many tools to win. The first of those battles only requires two sword stances, both used on Mianfu before sweeping. The second in Geosench Town saw me using three sword stances after Mian Xiao, who's now evolved, gets burned by Flame Body on the first high jump kick it uses, then misses one, allowing for Flame Charge to take out Mian Xiao, giving me more than enough speed to ensure Gyarados, Pyroar, and Honchkrow all went down later. Then, with the last battle against Normie Osborne yesterday, since he hasn't learned the definition of insanity, is doing the same f***ing thing over and over again, expecting shit to change! This time outed by Sword Stance once he does the same, Protect to block high jump kick, and Flame Charge to increase the speed as Pyroar comes out second. I actually couldn't do this before due to the Gyarados not having the Mega Stone and therefore being held for last place, but now that Pyroar is designated to come out second, I can get those last two sword stances up while taking Hyper Voice, then using Fly, Protect, Fly, Protect, and Fly in sequence to KO Pyroar, Honchkrow, and Gyarados to seal the deal. Perfect. Get out of my way since I've got an 8th Gym Badge to go get a hold of. Oh, in case you were wondering about the rival battles on Route 19, don't. They're too easy to be worth going over. Anyway, Wolfric, despite having both Talonflame and Ferrothorn on my team, is somewhat difficult due to his Pokemon having way better physical defense compared to special defense. That includes Pangoro with any whatever fighting type move that we have. I still try my best though with Ferrothorn, combating the hail damage from Snow Warning with leftovers while using two curses against his lead at Snow, taking three Ice Beams and going below half HP as Gyro Ball does connect in KO, leading to Cryogonal. I have enough HP to survive an Ice Beam here, but of course, it gets the freeze, so I'm forced into Talonflame, using Sword Stance once and going for Flame Charge to ensure we don't take a Confuse Ray to the dome, KOing and leaving just Avalug. From here, I figure we can swap into Pangoro to slam him with a hammer arm, but that does less than half and he's already setting up Curse. Very much not good. My last resort at this point, with all three of my super effective options depleted, is to go into my best special attacker and hope one more attack from this range will do him in. So I swap into Greninja, click Surf, and hope for the best. And thankfully, Greninja's best is good enough, KOing and earning us the final badge, gaining entry into the Pokemon League. No big changes to the team, and no interest in Serena's last battle, since I don't think y'all need to see a Ferrothorn sweep again. Anyway, league time. Melva, she's a Fire-type trainer, I have Fast Water-type, so four Surf's Dozen, Pyroar, Talonflame, Torkoal, and Chandelure. Sadly, she's the only one of the bunch that I can just click A to win. Instead, the other guys I gotta click on the D-pad. Wickstrom's up second, and I decide to go for a Meowstic sweep here. I know Klefki can't do much to me once a few Calm Minds are up thanks to all of his attacks like Flash Cannon being special, though a critical does make its way through my defenses, bringing Meowstic to just above half HP by the time all six Calm Minds have been established. From here, it's just a Psychic to Klefki, then to Scizor, following up with a Shadow Ball to Aegislash, 
then a few Thunderbolts and Shadow Balls alternating on Probopass, seeing as we've got to deal with Sturdy, plus a few full restores. But we're eventually able to do him in, thanks to all of his attacks also being special based. Two down, two to go. Third up on the radar is Drasna, and that's entirely because I can do another Meowstic sweep, this time getting rid of Shadow Ball for Protect to ensure I get the maximum recovery between Calm Minds, and that ends up being the correct decision. G starts off with Dragalge, who has all special attacks, but also has Sludge Bomb, a move that can poison Meowstic and potentially make her incapable of finishing the sweep. Thankfully, we only end up seeing a critical, no poison, but it does dip us below half. So we end up only getting three Calm Minds up before firing Psychic for the KO. Honestly, I only go for six since I want to make 1000% sure I'm going to KO everything without having to calculate, but here I'm pretty confident that just three is enough to take everyone down. So I'm able to alternate protecting Calm Mind, KOing Drasna's Altaria, Noivern, and Drudigan in sequence to KO and win the fight. Alright, now for the most difficult one, Seabold. Despite having Ferrothorn, Power Whip is 85% accurate, and his lead Clawitzer has Aura Sphere, a super effective special move. So you better know we're running that shit back with Meowstic. In fact, our level increase due to some of the residuals from the EXP share, plus the last two sweeps, has gotten Meowstic up to level 67 before this fight, going on 68 midway through. So one Calm Mind is all that we need, knocking out Clawitzer, Barbarical, Gyarados, and after some hesitation since I wasn't 100% sure I could KO it, Starmie, all with one plus one Thunderbolt each to win the fight. However, I also had the Zap Plate attached to ensure those KOs went through, rather than doing leftovers and protect strats, and I'm really happy I did since I'm not sure if those would have gotten the job done and I probably would have potentially lost Meowstic during that fight because of it, or would have had to swap out and start thinking, and we all know how good I am at thinking. Now then, what about Diantha? Is she any more challenging than in X? Well, slightly. Her lead, despite being entirely physical, is a Halucha with Flying Press, a move that can hit Ferrothorn for quite effective damage due to hitting for both Fighting and the Flying type due to its effect. Otherwise, that would be my main idea is just set up six curses and go. However, I think we can pull through with Talonflame for a good chunk of time here. First turn ends up going very nicely as I go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sword Stance, Trading it with a poison jab that luckily doesn't get the poison, but it does burn Hotlucha due to flame body, therefore having her attack stat. I figured this means she's going for sword stance, so to reverse that problem, I opt to not go for protect and instead using the second sword stance in a row, thinking that using protect here would be a waste of a turn and allow her to regain that attack stat with a sword stance. But apparently I'm wrong and she goes for a second poison jab. Alright, well, thankfully the third time's the charm, and the third and final sword stance I use, she goes for one of her own, wasting that turn and allowing for flame charge next turn to grab that KO, getting that speed boost for her second Pokemon in Tyrantrum. Ah, yeah, I knew I forgot something. If there was ever a time to have retained Steelwing, it would have been here, but I'm at plus six. I should still KO, right? Wrong, and that's uh, <laughs> that's because I forgot that the leftovers I had on when I was using acrobatics meant that it was only 55 power and not 110, allowing for Talonflame to not only KO, but for Tyrantrum to use Head Smash to get the Revenge KO. Gotta love quite effective attacks, after all, Stab plus 120 power plus- wait, I already used this joke today. In short, Talonflame is gone, but not forgotten as Head Smash procs Flame Body, burning Tyrantrum with just a hair of HP left to spare, KOing it between turns as I choose my next Pokemon. I'm actually not sure if she gets to choose after I choose, or if we're choosing at the same time technically, but it is the AI and I wouldn't be shocked if she chooses something super effective against me just because they're cheating. So I decide to go for Greninja to lure out Gorgeist, but somehow she sends in Aurorus. I mean, I get it because she has Thunder on it, but instead she goes for Light Screen after taking a Surf that brings her into the red. This leads to a full restore, but she's immediately punished with a critical hit that KOs from full. Well, that was awfully nice. Now what can we do from here with Gudra? Well, going for Ice Beam would be sensible, but not when A, Light Screen is in effect, and B, Focus Blast is an available move on this sloppy blowjob devil's moveset. Three cheers for the meatball being a weeb. But that aside, I have to swap here choosing Meowstic and going for Calm Mind since all of her moves are special and it resists Focus Blast, which happens to miss. 
From here, we just go back and forth with Dragon Pulse and Calm Mind as I take four of them while responding in kind with four Calm Minds. Somehow, though, even a plus four Psychic is not enough to KO this Wandering Goop Shield, allowing for a fifth Dragon Pulse to hit, bringing Meowsic down to just 12 HP. But with her heal locked into four restores, we're clear to KO, leading to Gorgeist. Now then, we should be able to sweep from here, right? Oh. Right, Shadow Sneak has priority, and I'm stupid! I'll make that two deaths, but all is well, as I can just go into Greninja and use Dark Pulse, KOing from full, and leaving just Gardevoir. Now I would stay in, but that fairy type is looking pretty damn scary at this point, so I swap into Ferrothorn to take a Moon Blast for minimal damage, lowering my special attack, while then getting my special defense lowered by Shadow Ball in the follow-up, Sadly for Diantha though, these stats are irrelevant, as one critical gyro ball is more than enough to tear through Mega Gardevoir in one hit, KOing and ending the Kalos region off with a bang. Alright, well we may as well take a look at the Pokemon we've used so far. I'm not too surprised that we're above 300 Pokemon, though what I am surprised about is that we're basically guaranteed to get through the Gen 3 Remakes next video with less Pokemon than were in the original Hoenn National Dex, which was a total of 386. I'm sure we'll be seeing some wacky mons come up through those games, especially with enough beginner Pokemon ready to fill out slots for those teams like Zigzagoon, Wormpole, Seedot, Talo, Wingle, and even Ralts, which if you recall, we ended up using Gallade in Platinum, but we never used Ralts or Curlia in battle themselves, hence why they're marked as blue, obtained, but never used. With all that said though, I'm looking forward to finishing up Generation 6 with Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire next time, and hopefully without so much of a wait. I've gotta say, I'm a bit burnt out on Pokemon. I have been for probably over a year now since I've been doing challenges for... Almost three and a half years now, and I definitely need a little bit of moderation in terms of playing other titles alongside Pokemon. So if there's any community suggestions for other games and series to try challenges in for once this series is finished, let me know down in the comments below. I'd love to take them. Anyway, thank you for watching.